All right, hello everyone. Welcome to the Harvard Law Forum. The forum, for, you, for those who don't know, is the longest running American law school speaker series. Over the years, we've hosted JFK, Jimmy Carter, Thurgood Marshall, Ralph Nader, Eleanor Roosevelt, Jerry Falwell, Cesar Chavez, Malcolm X, Timothy Leary, the inventor of LSD, and wrestling magnate Vince McMahon. So, you know, take that Harvard Law Review. Uh, this year, as head of both the Forum and the Democratic Law Society, I'm focusing a series of talks on what can be seen as a burgeoning new view of the law, a framework we're calling Law and Democracy. Law and Democracy re-envisions the law as a tool to enable the public to participate in power. That is, a tool to create a democratic society. That's in contrast to the prevailing views of the law we normally see here at law school, which, whether it's the view of the law as a means to ensure laissez-faire markets and efficient allocation of value, or the view of the, law, of the law as a mechanism for expert technocratic oversight of society. Rather, in a democratic society, the law's primary rule, rule, rule is uh, to empower the public to construct and participate in the world around them. If you're interested in what that view uh, looks like, what that view of the law looks like, there's a sign-up sheet that'll be going around in a bit and folks can put their names down to get involved. But regardless of all that, our speaker today, Chris Mackin, has worked tirelessly over the years promoting a more democratic society through democratizing the workplace where people spend the majority of their time. I'll let Chris explain his own work, but I wanted to emphasize that the thought and debate over democracy at work that Chris engages in is not a new phenomenon. In fact, the extension of democracy into the corporate firm lies at the roots of the labor movement. The Knights of Labor, which was one of the founding organizations of the labor movement and the first post-Civil War labor organization that was open to all laborers, including blacks and women, had as one of their central principles the establishment of, quote, cooperative institutions such as will tend to supersede the wage system by the introduction of a cooperative industrial system. Many people in the early republic right up through the New Deal thought that democracy in the corporate firm was an essential component of democracy in the political sector. And as Chris has pointed out in his own recent piece in the New Republic, which you guys should all check out, this labor republican line of thinking was so important in the US at one point that it was a central theme of a dedication ceremony at our very own Harvard Business School's Baker Library. At that ceremony, the CEO of GE, Owen Young, this was in 1927. The CEO of GE had this to say about the industrial workplace that had enveloped the economy over the past 100 years. He said, quote, into these larger scale businesses, we have brought together larger amounts of capital and larger numbers of workers than existed in cities we once thought great. We've been put to it, however, to discover the true principles which should govern their relations. From one point of view, they, meaning workers and capital, they were partners in a common enterprise. And from another point of view, they were enemies fighting for the spoils of their common achievement. I hope the day may come, again, this is the CEO of GE, I hope the day may come when these great business organizations will truly belong to the men and women, we would add now, hopefully, the men who are giving their lives and efforts to them, I care not in what capacity. Then, we shall dispose once and for all of the charge that industry organizations are autocratic and not democratic. Then we shall have no hired men. So here to describe to us the path forward to realize this vision of workplace democracy, let's all welcome Chris Mack into the Harvard Law Forum. Hello, hello. Not sure this is broadcasting. I hope it is. Hello, everybody. Good afternoon. Good to see everyone here. Um, and uh, great to hear that setup by Martin, which I will echo some of Mr. Young's uh, material uh, at the end of this. at the end of this talk. So um, <coughs> first things first. Workplace democracy is the lead title lead idea of our title here. And you may know, you may notice that we don't have a lot of it um, in the American economy today, and it's reasonable to ask why. 
This talk will share practical methods and policy ideas for how to achieve it, but I want to precede that discussion with a combination of moral and empirical arguments as to why we should have workplace democracy in the first place. I don't assume that everybody is on the same page about that, and I think that the framework is necessarily vague and needs to be filled in. I would say that without compelling moral justifications, what we're talking about here risks becoming just another technique, easily forgotten with no staying power when the going gets rough. And what's talked about here in terms of the scale of changes is not something that is easy. Uh, without evidence that it works, that people can produce products and services under these kinds of arrangements on a competitive basis, it'll be difficult to enlist people to take this journey. So that's the uh, background. And here is where we're going to go. Uh, I want to be able to present some moral arguments that will provide some staying power, hopefully, for these ideas. I want to do a sort of quick bit of uh, intellectual geography in terms of like where does this idea of workplace democracy fit? It's a nice sounding slogan, but how can we make it something uh, with, a, with a home? I want to touch on the history, which I'll go quicker now that uh, that Martin has, has helped with that. Then we'll talk about employee ownership, where it's actually happening. Um, and this is, by way of background, this has been my career. I've been working in the field of employee ownership since 1978 for 40 years. Uh, started with a nonprofit up Massachusetts Avenue here that was, we were sponsored by the American Friends Services Committee, a group called the Industrial Cooperative Association. Uh, this is when I was a graduate student at Harvard in the Graduate School of Education, actually, uh, where I first encountered these ideas. I was someone who was doing school democracy, uh, but I, I read the uh, labor history, the labor Republican tradition, and I was meeting historians and economists, and I just fell in love with this idea. It also occurred to me that the democratic school activity that I was doing, we were sending kids out into a, a world of work that didn't speak that language, and that perhaps the problem was further upriver, and we had to find ways of democratizing the workplace. And I was delighted to learn that I wasn't the first one, and my friends weren't the first ones to, to sort this out. There, there is a great history behind it. So we'll talk about that, we'll talk about some facts and figures, then we'll talk about <coughs> a policy idea, it's also in the title, on what's going on in the present in this Employee Equity Loan Act. And then, uh, in conclusion, uh, there are some killer quotes uh, that I'm hoping will keep you in your seats to the end uh, that, are, that are particularly designed for a law school audience, uh, which I hope uh, you might uh, find interesting. This entire presentation, by the way, is, is, is up on uh, ChristopherMacken.org, the, the, so you, you can go through it at your leisure if you'd like. Okay, background, framing the topic. Um, the moral case, and then we'll talk about locating this and then the historical roots. So first, the moral case, there are three arguments to focus on here. Um, the first one is economic inequality as wealth inequality, and the ways in which Worker ownership, employee ownership of businesses speaks to wealth inequality as a distinct construct. A second moral frame to talk about is just is an, that democracy has been on an incomplete journey, and these ideas help complete it. A third and most controversial, and perhaps novel to your ears, uh, claim is that employment law that you learn in this law school and that we accept and is right under our noses uh, is the institutionalized acceptance of the renting of human beings. And that that is a problematic concession made long ago uh, that can be reversed and that we need to understand in order to see the depth of the difficulties we're dealing with. Um, I recognize that we also have to, um, again, not just make moral arguments, but supply you with some evidence that these ideas are not a fantasy. Um, and there are academic colleagues of mine. <coughs> I teach with some of them at Rutgers part-time now. Richard Freeman um, here at Harvard is 
has been one of the scholars that's been doing work on this for a long time. We'll get around to talking about that. So let's go through the moral arguments uh, first. And the first point uh, is that inequality is more extreme in wealth than it is in income. This is not commonly understood. Um, and I, I, I would claim that our grasp of the problem of economic inequality, as even educated people, is, is still primitive. When people talk about economic inequality, they generally jump right to wages and to income and to, and to paychecks. You're more likely to hear income inequality as the, as the problem than wealth inequality. Well, it's a fairly simple fact when you think about it, that, that in, in some senses, you know, paychecks are just a, a symptom or a surface manifestation of an inequality problem. Uh, and wealth is in some sense stored income. Uh, and it is a, it is a, it's a different value construct. Uh, it's one that if you have it, in the, in the, particularly in the form of assets, this is something the rich know very well, the wealthy know very well, is that it can grow as you sleep. It provides a certain kind of foundation and security that income and paychecks will never uh, provide. We should all be campaigning and working hard for things like the $15 an hour minimum wage, but if we're not doing anything to attack this wealth problem, I fear we're not gonna get very far very fast. Uh, here's a statistic, rather dramatic one. You may remember from the Federal Reserve in Boston did a study that this is no typo. The median net worth of black Bostonians is $8. That's the wealth. That's a, that's a statistic that, that sort of rams home to me the importance of wealth as a construct when we're talking about inequality. We should care about this gentleman's paycheck, but the fact that he and, and his family have $8 of wealth is certainly a problem. Um, and here are some more detailed statistics, and, and those, pe pe those of you who want to study wealth <clears throat> and be able to sort of focus on that as this is a category, I recommend to you the work of New York University professor Ed Wolf. He's the lead scholar in this field. This is a recent book from Harvard University Press, Century of Wealth in America. And look at what he shows. <clears throat> the bottom 90%, this is just financial wealth, okay? There are other, it's a longer discussion to get into, but the, in terms of financial instruments and forms of financial wealth, business equity, which is equity mostly in closely held, privately held businesses, uh, the bottom 90% of American society owns 6% of business equity. And the top 1% owns 63%. And we could go do the, you know, uh, the, the, the 1% within the 10%, the 0.1%, and it gets even more concentrated. But this, this at least illustrates the beginning of the problem when we begin to think about <clears throat> what we're facing as a wealth inequality challenge. Um, so my hope is that the policy debate of the future, or policy debates of the future, will be as much about wealth inequality versus income inequality, we much about as wealth versus income, about property and not just about pay. And surprise, surprise, the punchline here is that employee ownership, broad-based employee ownership of companies, is probably the most effective and scaled way of addressing wealth inequality. I don't think anything else comes close. Guaranteed annual income, whatever you'd like, uh, this is, the most effective way to do it. Okay, second moral challenge, if wealth inequality is not enough to get you going. Um, here is, uh, this is a, one of my sort of early um, heroes when I got into this business, a, a very mainstream Yale political science professor who, was, who wrote his last book was called Econo A Preface to Economic Democracy. He was, um, he earned his fame, and this red textbook, anybody who's my age, went to college around my time, I don't know if they're still selling it, was one, it, was, it was in every undergraduate political science course. He was considered in the dean of political theory of, about democracy. 
And what we find is that of the bookend to his career, he starts articulating about what political democracy is. And he comes to the conclusion that political democracy cannot prosper, cannot be what it should be, unless there's a corresponding form of economic democracy. And he speaks about how it's with economic democracy you can, you can help cultivate moral agency in people if they are participants in their enterprises. I was lucky enough to meet him, uh, and it just, it, again, it helped reinforce that this was something that wasn't just a, some sort of crazy left-wing program. You know, when you can have people of this stature recognize and admit that political democracy on its own isn't going to probably survive unless there's some kind of corresponding economic democracy, you're on a, you're on a journey. And he says there should be such a journey. Now finally, these are the two easy moral claims. Now the fun begins. Employment law, the renting of human beings. Uh, dwell on that for a second. The renting of human beings. So that sounds like, is that some sort of rhetorical claim here? Well, where does it come from? How do we arrive at concepts like this? Here's a guy, uh, Paul Samuelson, sure, gentleman, uh, you know, productive scholar, what, probably the most famous 20th century economist done at MIT. This is his text, Economics, that again, most every undergraduate in the 20th century took an economics course um, used. It's the Bible, economics. Here's a quote from that text. Since slavery was abolished, human earning power is forbidden by law to be capitalized. A man is not even free to sell himself. He must rent himself at a wage. So this is, this is the field of economics, admitting straight ahead that what we have is a human rental relationship in the workplace. Now that's a little rough, a little problematic. So what do we do? What do we do with this harsh sounding Samuelson news? Well, as a culture, as a society, we make use of a euphemism. And what's a euphemism? Is we substitute an agreeable or inoffensive expression for one that may offend or suggest something unpleasant. Rented human beings is a little unpleasant to some ears. Uh, the euphemism is higher. We hire people, we don't rent them. The potentially offensive expression is rent. The true description, we get it from Samuelson, is we're renting. Um, the central human institution structuring modern economies is the employment relationship. Hiring, the initiating act of the employment relationship is a euphemism, an agreeable linguistic substitute for renting. And last but not least, employees today, and ever since the employee construct was invented, are rented humans. That's what we've got. And we teach law about it. And really, the only right employees have, if they don't have some kind of protection from a union contract, is to quit. It's a contractual, it's seen to be a contractual relationship, and that seemed to be in sort of mainstream intellectual disciplines to be sufficient. Uh, some would beg to differ. And here's a guy who begs to differ, my friend who we started uh, in 1978 doing this work. Uh, the most productive scholar and original thinker in this field, a guy named David Ellerman. He calls himself a neo-abolitionist these days. A lot of his critique of the employment relationship in particular comes out of studying uh, anti-slavery movements um, and studying the coverture marriage contract, studying slavery through the ages, including um, here in the 19th century of the United States. David says, that responsible human agency is inalienable. Just as we overcame slavery with the claim that human beings are inalienable, they can't and shouldn't be bought and sold. David claims responsible human agency is inalienable and cannot be rented. Therefore, the modern employment contract is invalid. It's fraudulent. 
Managers and workers, instead of being employers and employees, should work for themselves in enterprises structured as democratic social institutions competing in regulated market economies. That, to simplify, is his, his affirmative position. This isn't just to take down the employment relationship, it's to substitute it with something that recognizes human agency and human responsibility. A couple of illustrative quotes that are great. I'm risking the camera angle. Uh, the contract to rent human beings is an institutional fraud legally sponsored by a society based on renting instead of owning other humans <clears throat> so that the positive and negative fruits of the rented people can be appropriated by the employer. That is the basis for the neo-abolitionist claim that the employer, employee contract for the renting of human beings is inherently invalid. One more. The fact that a whole economic civilization is founded on a bogus contract, lawyers of the future, the contract to rent human beings, to transfer what is untransferable, is unbelievable to most people, which is why so much false consciousness needs to be socially constructed to sustain the system. While the earlier systems of legalized violations of human rights, chattel slavery, feudalism, coverture marriage contracts, had their platoons of intellectual <coughs> cleric hirelings or mercenaries, no previous system had anything approaching the sophistication of orthodox economic, political science, legal theory, and other social sciences. Um, that's, there is a, there's lots of papers, lots of books. It's very productive. Uh, there's lots to go there. And as a matter of fact, <laughs> David <coughs> is, uh, going to be in town Monday, October 29, through Thursday, November 1. If I was a law student here and I was interested in what has been presented, I'd see to it that he'd be invited over for chat. Um, and he'll be staying at my apartment in Harvard Square. Okay, so <clears throat> let's see. Let's summarize. We're going to get getting through these moral claims. You like inequality? You like the incomplete journey? Or do you like the renting of human beings. Those are reasons to dig into this issue, for those of you who are looking for reasons. Then we gotta do some evidence, because you gotta be Pareto optimal. You have to show that this actually works, and that you're not sacrificing efficiency to make it work, and guess what? We could, we could solve that. We can answer that claim. Uh, quick little thing here about intellectual geography. This is, I'm, I'm being a, a stickler. So workplace democracy, I like, eh, it's, a, it's an okay idea, but what, where is it, where does it fit? What does it mean? Is that gonna be how we're gonna like call this going forward? I'm not sure. Um, I like a broader notion, borrowing from Dahl, in some sense of economic democracy, with workplace democracy as the sort of biggest subset of that. There are other reform ideas, pick your favorite, that might be called economic democracy. They don't have anything to do with the workplace. Um, <clears throat> they're all wonderful ideas. We're centrally focused on the workplace and on production and on property as the sort of fundamental institutions to change uh, the economy. Um, and within that workplace democracy frame, what do we have? We really have two ways of looking at that. We've got standard union management collective bargaining the achievements of, of collective bargaining that have happened against great odds over the years, certain kind of negative power, certain kind of limitation of the rental relationship. It's on its heels now, it's not strong, and in some sense, it doesn't get to the heart of the matter, which we'll talk about. And the second idea is employee ownership. <clears throat> and it's private sector, we're talking about stock, we're talking about ESOPs and cooperatives, we're talking about a general idea of labor hiring capital, and we're talking about the employment relationship, ending human rentals, no hired men, as Mr. Young said. Okay, and now quickly on historical stuff, because Martin did do this, I recommend to you this book. Uh, those of you who wanna um, get excited about how it isn't a brand new idea, it was in fact, this idea of worker ownership, was the natural reaction of, on, on the part of farmers and tradespeople 
whose parents had fought in the political revolution here in the, in the 18th century, early in the 19th century, being faced with Europeans coming back across the ocean, this time with dollar bills and the steam engine and factories, and saying to these former farmers and tradespeople, we, have, we got a deal for you. We want you to be an employee, and you're going to work for us under these sorts of conditions. You don't have to worry your pretty little heads about anything. You just work your 10 hours initially, and then it became eight hours. And we get the profits, and we're on our way. Well, there were people, and they were the, there were people of the labor movement of the 19th century who said, that is the worst idea you can ever imagine. Uh, go back to Europe. Uh, they started cooperatives. Uh, they started them, a lot of them around here in Massachusetts, in Stoneham, in Lynn, and they made barrels, they made rope, they made shoes. Um, and what they decided to do, in, when faced with this proposition, was to pool their resources, and they recognized that it made more sense to make 1,000 shoes a week than 100 shoes in the small shop. So they pooled their resources and they formed cooperatives. And for one, at least one generation, or you know, one, probably, uh, you know, this, this, the, the science is clear on this, but it looks like for about one generation, they competed with the, the employer-employee model. But guess what? They weren't able to replenish their capital stock. They weren't able to bring in the, the newest steam engine, the newest sewing machine. And so they lost out to the European competitors who had a lot of money to burn from centuries of feudalism to be able to drive home that no, the industrial structure that shall prevail is the employer-employee structure. And this idea, this resistance, uh, went under the waves, except people wrote, wrote it down. And if you study it, this is the first stage of the American labor movement, before the FLCIO. Quick couple quick quotes from one of my fa favorite gents from back in this day, a guy named George McNeil of Amesbury, Massachusetts, who wrote in 1887, an inevitable and irresistible conflict between the wage system of labor and the Republican system of government is proposed by our European friends. Inevitable, inevitable and irresistible conflict <clears throat> between the wage system of labor and the Republican system of government that our parents and grandparents just fought for. He viewed cooperative ownership by workers as a means to turn the tide to, quote, engraft Republican principles into our industrial system. Hence the name labor Republicans. Another way in which these people talked about that is that if, if we have stood up a political republic, we should stand up a corresponding industrial republic. Right out of Robert Dahl. Robert Dahl picked it up many years after that, that kind of symmetry. Um, 20th century, that's where I got my start. So did he. <laughs> And this, uh, this bit of politics, um, we'll talk about that Russell Long, the son of Huey Long, that's Huey behind Russell there, um, got control of the tax code. And in the last era of his career, he wanted to reach back to what his father, the famous populist, the Bernie Sanders of his day, with some warts that Bernie doesn't have. But Huey Long was a populist. He didn't think that Franklin Roosevelt was going hard and fast enough against the economic inequality. He started to share the wealth clubs. He wanted people to talk about that. Well, Russell was much more conservative. Um, and at the end of his career, he wanted to connect to what his father's themes and ideas were. And he, as you'll see in a minute, he met up with some people who helped him conceive of this idea of, of being able to write tax law to induce capitalists to share ownership with their workers. And there are 7,000 of those with 14 million workers. We'll see in a second. And then here we are in the 21st century, what's going on now? Um, ESOPs and private equity, in quotes. I'm a part of a group that's raising a, a large fund. We hope it'll be a three or $500 million fund to be able to back management and workers to be able to buy them out as an alternative to going to conventional private equity. There's also a revival of the cooperative movement. There's this platform cooperative stuff that was talked about um, a year ago when I came to a session here. Um, there's some interesting stuff going on and there's some legislative ideas. So this is just to put it in history. All right, what is employee ownership? That was a long setup, I apologize, but 
That's the fun I have, okay? I know this other stuff, coal. Uh, so employee ownership. Um, this really happens in four ways. You can expropriate a factory, as was done in Argentina in the, at the turn of the century, and at many factories. It's not a generalizable policy, but that sometimes happens. Workers literally take over abandoned factories and run them on a worker ownership basis. Uh, you can start factories this way. That's, how, that's the cooperative movement. It's most associated with that idea. It's usually people who have read something or thought something, talked to their friends and said, you know, we're gonna do this on a democratic basis. And the cooperative movement is a, it's been around for a long time. It was talked about here last year. Again, it's primarily a creature of startups. The most scaled and significant uh, example of the success of cooperatives is in the Basque Country of Spain. And Mondragon, uh, been there four times. My part, one of my partners is on the, on the faculty of Mondragon University, Fred Freundlich, and um, that's where to go to learn about this. And now platform cooperatives are being talked about by Trevor Schultz and others, and that's a promising idea. Again, it's mostly focused on startups. A third way this, gets ha this happens is through negotiation, through collective bargaining. Very rare these days. Um, I was involved in the United Airlines um, uh, employee buyout back in 96, 97, I think it was. Uh, the employees there had 55% of the stock and they controlled the board. It's a fascinating story that's very misunderstood. It actually had a lot of promise um, and there were some structural flaws. A, one, a deal that has, is up and running that, that my group, American Working Capital, um, helped design is a 100% employee-owned supermarket chain in Oklahoma, about 100 stores called Homeland Food Stores. And we worked with the UFCW to construct that deal and to negotiate it on their behalf, and it's resulted in a 100% employee-owned chain. So it can happen that way, but, but overall, the most overwhelming wet verb here of how this happens is uh, when workers and managers somehow which I'll explain, by profitable, cash flow positive, scaled, closely held, privately held companies, right in the middle of Main Street, USA. That's overwhelmingly the largest segment or niche. There they are. Almost 7,000 firms, 1.3 trillion in assets, 14 million people, workers with uh, account values that average $134,000, um, that are, uh, separate from their 401k plans um, that are wealth accounts that they, that are, uh, that they, they have. The blue and red are S-corps and C-corps. We can talk about that. Um, <clears throat> where are we in terms of converting the American economy to this kind of structure? It's not very far. We've got about 1.5% of the, of the legitimate market that we would target for this, which I'm saying are, are private sector firms of over, over 50 employees. Those are like ESOPable firms. You know, about 1.5% of them. Um, and so there's a, there's a rich market to go after. Uh, examples of the companies. You may have heard of some of these. Public supermarkets is the largest, 190,000 uh, workers. Um, let's see, Parsons, that's an engineering firm. You've got, and one that you, I think I could see in the room is represented number 11, uh, Gore and Associates, the maker of Gore-Tex. Those of you who are wearing Gore-Tex, that's a, uh, a company in Delaware, it's 100% employee-owned firm. So those are some scaled companies that have done this. Another, I mean, another one locally, which is there, is Harpoon Brewing Company. Uh, Dan Canary and his partners sold internally to their employees. I urge you to drink Harpoon, if you like these ideas. Um, how does this work? Evidence. Um, Joseph Blasby is coming to town, my colleague, uh, for a session in a month or something? December 14th. December 14th. I urge you to, he's the guy, he and Doug Cruz and Richard Freeman have done the hard work on, on not the moral arguments as much as these economic arguments, the evidence. And guess what? People working together for themselves work better and smarter. The firms are more productive. They grow faster. Sales grow faster. Uh, it works. Not to say that the science is over, 
Uh, but there's been a lot of science. There's been a lot of writing on this. Um, and we could talk more about that if you want to. Um, from a public policy standpoint, employee ownership, uh, more businesses are more likely to be retained, 25% more likely to stay in business. And employee owners are four, four times less likely to be laid off during the last recession. So pay payroll taxes are being paid. Uh, states are in better shape if firms are owned in a broad-based local way. That's some evidence for you. Now let's switch to how does it happen. This is the super quick uh, legal 101 of how you do an ESOP transaction. How could people with no money, the people on the left side, buy from these swell fellows on the right side? Because these workers don't have any money. Well, we get back to our friend Russell Long. He knew that, and he said, I'm gonna figure out a way to do it. Um, he learned from a gentleman named Louis Kelso, a very creative um, economist lawyer who thought hard about how, well, why can't pension plans, and you know, that are these existing legal structures that exist in many companies, and there were more DB pension plans back in those days, can't they potentially borrow money on behalf of the employees as a group? Because you actually have the employees as a group already gathered through in a legal structure of a pension plan. So why not enable the pension plan to borrow money? And he wrote, he wrote books about that, and he convinced Louis Kelso that that was a good idea. And a law that you all have heard of, I think, called ERISA was passed. And an amendment to ERISA was introduced to provide tax incentives for the sellers of businesses to be able to sell internally to their employees. Uh, so companies, there's a company, create trusts, employee stock ownership trusts, a new kind of benefit plan, an, an additional benefit plan. And what happens is that the trust goes to the bank and borrows the money. Employees are not coming out of pocket. The seller has to want to do this because the collateral for the loans are the assets of the firm. Why does the seller want to do it? Well, one of the reasons is that Russell Long put some tax incentives in there. If you, in the partners at, at uh, Harpoon, in a, in a local example, if you sell internally to one of those trusts, you pay no capital gains tax. That was the, that's the easiest to understand incentive that, that Long put into the law. Further and deeper, if firms are 100% employee owned, they pay no corporate taxes. They're, they're a pass-through corporation. Uh, where, and that's what's led to their growth. So it's a benefit plan that can borrow money. It's a, it, it has to be inclusive. If you're gonna do this, you can't say, this side of the room participates, that side can't. Uh, it's like a 401k plan, the same, the same rules, um, and it's tax favored. And that's what's driven the statistics that, that you saw. Uh, now let's talk about policy and politics. Um, there's a problem. We only have 1.5% of the, of the available companies, and there's been slow growth of the ESOP field in, in recent years. So why? Well, first problem is time. Sellers eager to make a decision. There, there are willing buyers. There's strategic or private, strategic buyers of private equity waiting right outside the door to be able to gobble up these companies. Um, there are advisors and brokers who are close to these business owners who don't know what the heck this is and are more likely to advise on a conventional sale. There's cultural confusion. How can low wealth employees possibly buy companies? And that one would think that this is a bottom-up thing if the workers are buying the firm. Well, in fact, we're gonna, I'm gonna address this, this is mostly a top-down consideration. It's adopted as an idea because the seller or the owner thinks it's a good idea. And I should say that many of those owners are not just driven by the tax proposition. Many of them knowing that they're gonna get a market price for their assets, like the idea of selling to their employees and prefer it to selling to private equity or to strategic people. They know who has made them rich after all, it's their employees, and they prefer to do it. There are decent people who want to do that. Um, the leadership initiative is confusing the people who's gonna lead this, and then finally capital, final, final dollar risk capital is not available, and secured lending at present only goes so far. What I mean by that is that most ESOP transactions to get to 100% are, are have to happen in at least two tranches you're not gonna have a bank lend 100% of the value of a company if you've got a successful company. 
And so finding that high risk capital to, to close a deal at 100% is difficult, um, which is one of the reasons why business owners don't do it. You have to be a patient seller. Um, that's a problem. What's the solution to this? Well, we've got to build up specialty institutions, private equity-like groups, uh, like one I work for and some others, uh, and, we have to and we have to find a way of providing scaled, secure credit. Um, and we've got to encourage bottom-up activity here, where the middle management and the workers are talking to the boss about this. We have an idea about how to do that. Because there's two ways of doing it right now. You either sell to private equity as strategic buyers or you sell internally to your people, but the resources to do it are limited. And here's what we're up against. Private equity has got a $2.5 trillion war chest. They're ready to buy any good company that's around. My friends and I in the, in the, in the, in the field, together, we have about a billion that we can invest. Uh, we need more institutions to do that. Maybe you'll go to work for one of them at some point. I hope you will. Uh, these are American Working Capital is the one I work with. Uh, Mosaic and Long Point are two others. We need more of these. But what we're talking about today is a public policy initiative of how to scale this, how to get out of the low level that we are. <clears throat> how do we do it? And these are the, these are the three people who wrote the paper uh, that I'm glad I'll put on my website. For those of you who are interested, Dick May of American Working Capital is the primary uh, genius behind this idea, if I might prejudice what I think of our idea or characterize it. Okay, so what's the purpose? We need to have a guarantee. The Employee Equity Loan Act proposes that over a 10-year period, the federal government would provide an annual guarantee of $100 billion to SBA, EDA, or Export-Import Bank certified lending institutions for the purpose of lending to certified broad-based employee ownership trusts. The guarantee should apply to the full spectrum of low, lower middle market private held businesses up to 300 million, employing up to 3,000 employees. This idea can make use of existing infrastructure of banks. We're not talking about starting a big federal bank program. We're talking about um, Credit worthiness can be established by having this program be uh, work through the banks. The security of an ELA guarantee will motivate lenders to lend, aligning their incentives with the goal of broad-based employee ownership. We're empowering buyers with this idea. Again, we're not just waiting for the seller to do it. If there's a sign in every bank window saying, talk to the boss about ownership, um, there are going to be more conversations about this idea. Um, and we're We'd be, we'd be overcoming resistance in having an idea like this, of this scale. Uh, guess what? It's been done before. This kind of big idea, using the full faith and credit of the federal government to achieve a social end, an economic end, happened under a Republican, Herbert Hoover. And when was that? 1932. Um, What did they do? <laughs> what they did, what he did, was to provide federal home loan guarantees through the Federal Home Loan Bank Act that allowed people with little or no savings, like workers have little or no savings, to buy homes. This is a policy that obviously extends to today. It's arguably created an American middle class. It was focused on housing stock. It was birthed at, an, at a time when there was concern about inequality that is, I believe, worse now. So if we care about scaled ideas, we go back to the playbook. Franklin Roosevelt implemented most of this. But to be fair, the idea came from a Republican, from Herbert Hoover. Uh, how would we do it? Where would we administer it? Those are three agencies that administer uh, federal credit programs right now, the SBA, the EDA, and the Export-Import Bank. I would like to get this out of the SBA, frankly. I'd like to, it to be in the EDA. I want to get this idea out of the image that it's a small business thing. I want to be able to use an idea like this, go after scaled companies. Um, that's how you would do it. Um, and what kind of impact would it have? What would it do about that problem of the black guy with $8 of uh, net worth? We started this. Uh, 
this presentation with. Well, here, are, because of our friend Ed Wolf, we could see the five family wealth quintiles that exist in the United States right now. Uh, the bottom three we see quintiles. 60% of the, of the American population has no more than $17,000 in savings or net worth. 60%. That sounds like Herbert Hoover bill to me in terms of the, of the emergency of inequality. Um, what would this idea do if you were able to fully deploy the money? Um, over a 10-year period of time, the rich get richer, but the bottom 60% begin to accumulate wealth accounts of a kind that they would never be able to get by saving from their paycheck, $15 an hour or whatever. It's only by having an ownership intervention that that kind of wealth can be accumulated by ordinary people. Uh, realities of politics, doing something like this. Incremental change versus big picture change. Well, here's Kirsten Gillibrand. She's interested in this idea, and God bless her. She just passed a bill this summer to try to promote and to grow awareness about this. Um, but it doesn't, it, there's no economics associated with it. There is a small a loan guarantee program that exists already with the SBA of limited at five, five million dollars. That's great, but it doesn't really move the needle. Um, along comes Elizabeth Warren with her Accountable Capitalism Act. Great idea, um, no mention of ownership, no real financial dimension. There's just an implicit hope, I, I'm assuming, I'm reading into it, that if you have 40% of the members of a board of directors being workers, that they're gonna somehow influence the policy with management and workers are gonna get a pay raise. Well, pay raises are not really the heart of the problem. Ownership and control is the problem. And here we are with our ELA idea. We want to amend these agencies, we want 10 million to 500 million dollar guarantees, not 5 million ones. We want, to, we want to enlist the participation of existing banks, and we want to stand up and start conversations inside companies. It'll probably be led by some combination of middle management and workers saying, hey boss, what, you know, you're getting a little long on the tooth. You know, what, what, are you, what are you gonna do with the business here? We understand your kids don't necessarily want it. You know about this ELA program? We could make a deal. Those, that's what I hope would happen with something like this. Okay, so summarize this. This is too much. Whatever, I'm not gonna go to that. I wanna conclude, us uh, students, uh, with a conservative member of parliament in England, Lord Eustace Percy. We'll start with him, and then we're gonna go to Martin's friend, uh, Owen Young. There he is in his resplendent robes. This is what he had to say in a 1944 lecture, the Riddell Lecture. He said, here is the most urgent challenge to political invention ever offered to the jurist and the statesman. The human association, which in fact produces and distributes wealth, the association of workmen, managers, technicians, and directors, is not an association recognized by law. The association which the law does recognize, the association of shareholders, creditors, and directors, is incapable of production and is not expected by the law to perform those functions. We have to give law to the real association and to withdraw meaningless privilege from the imaginary one. Ta-da. Um, I think he's right. Your lawyers, your future lawyers, I'd urge you to go to the full text to read it, but the challenge is clear enough. The, the structures and conventions of corporate law, as they've arisen, are conti historically contingent. They didn't have to be written the way they were written. Powerful people steered them in different ways. People who are intellectually honest, like this guy, said there's something wrong with how this capitalist legal structure is developing here. It's rewarding and protecting the wrong people. Doesn't mean that capital shouldn't get any rewards. Capital should get risk-adjusted returns. But capital shouldn't have the affirmative power to govern production. That should be in the hands of the workers and the managers and the firms. That's the, that's the challenge. And along comes, okay, we're getting back here to Baker Library. Found a picture from 1927. This is um, 
a dedication of, of, of Baker Library at the Harvard Business School, and here it is today. You know the building. A pretty building by the Charles. It was all isolated back in that day. Um, somehow, uh, Owen D. Young, was, who was the CEO, or the chairman of General Electric, was invited to give the dedication ceremony. And you've heard, we're just gonna repeat, you've heard the highlights of his remarks. Um, and his, again, his, his remarks, think about this for a second. This is 1927. Industrial capitalism is barely 100 years old in terms of it taking over the economy. Because 100 years back, it was farmers and tradespeople. If you want to push that back a little further, fine. But he was able to, he, and from his vantage point, he's like looking at like, okay, and we're building a business school, this first kind of business school to look at this stuff. Um, well, this is what he had to say. I'm just repeating uh, what Martin said. Into these larger scale businesses, we have brought together larger amounts of capital and larger numbers of workers than existed in cities once thought great. We have been put to it, however, by this talk, to discover the true principles which should govern their relations. From one point of view, they were partners in a common enterprise. From another, they were enemies fighting for the spoils of their common achievement. I hope the day may come when these great business organizations will truly belong to the men who are giving their lives and their efforts to them. I care not in what capacity. Then we shall dispose once and for all of the charge that industry organizations are autocratic and not democratic. Then we shall have no hired men. He spied what the labor Republicans a few decades before him were writing about. Hired men. The employer-employee relationship, bad idea. We're only 100 years into this, people, he's saying from the Harvard Business School. We can change this. That objective may be a long way off, but it is a worthy, it's worthy to engage the research and efforts of the Harvard School of Business. Here's a biography done by his daughter and her husband of Owen Young, and in chapter 20, they comment on the speech. This was the chairman of General Electric speaking in 1927. Was anybody listening? If some of Young's auditors were puzzled or dismayed, the speech as a whole was well received, but this time without cheers. Nor is there anything in the record to indicate that the faculty of the Harvard Business School found Young's objective worthy of their sustained attention, much less of any systematic research. The Harvard Business School. I would contend, and here we are, this last slide, Owen Young had a geography problem. He was just a little bit lost. Uh, he was on the wrong side of the Charles River, uh, wrong intellectual discipline. He should have been over here. That was built in 1883, Austin Hall. He could have been giving the 45th anniversary speech at Austin Hall and had an, an audience of lawyers listening who perhaps could have put pen to paper and said, you know, you're right, Mr. Young. We're going to do something about it. I think it is lawyers who can and should, in some senses, take the lead. I mean, they're good businessmen, business owners, we know that they exist. There are people who would want to do the right thing, but we have to have the laws and the structures to do it. That's it. So, not much time.